Let me uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and uh, pay my respects to their elders, past, uh, present, and emerging. Uh, welcome to our first breakfast seminar uh, for the year. Um, and traditionally, for the first breakfast seminar of the year, we invite uh, the winner of uh, the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Science. Uh, and this year, we're so pleased that it's Rose, Rose Amal from uh, UNSW. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit in a second about uh, Rose. We've got a pretty exciting schedule this year. If you look at the, your seat, uh, you will see a selection of different speakers. Uh, and uh, we're really trying also to get out there and engage across the biggest possible uh, diversity of science that we have in this state. And again, we are also focused a little bit on understanding the prosperity agenda. So as I'm sure Rose will talk about, it's not just the science and the engineering, it's actually also about the way that we convert that into job prosperity, jobs, and social outcomes for the state. Which brings me very, very nicely to the subject of Rose's talk. Rose uh, works in the very complex area of catalysts. Uh, and I remember when I last did chemistry at school, uh, catalysts was one of those magic areas that they didn't tell you too much about, except that you needed to use platinum or something like that to make one of those reactions go. And yet, it's kind of the pivotal part in so much of modern chemistry, whether it's organic or inorganic chemistry, or lots of different ways. And it holds the key, really, to taking a chemical reaction and making it economically viable, all right, in lots of different ways. And Rose has spent her career applying or developing catalyst technology uh, for primarily for energy. Um, and in particular, converting solar energy into things like hydrogen and to other types of uh, material, which ultimately can go on to be used in a sustainable and green manner. So this is kind of at the center of the sorts of things that really we're concerned about in this state. How we genuinely start transitioning away from fossil fuels into renewable energies at a sustainable rate. How we genuinely actually use that potentially to create our own industry in the new modern energy technologies and particularly through this type of chemistry. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to hear where the state is going in this area and particularly the achievements uh, that Rose has made uh, in, these, uh, uh, in this area. So Rose is got so many awards, it's, I'm not really sure I should actually list them all out. Uh, but she, uh, of course, was the uh, recipient of the Premier's Prize for Science uh, last year. But she's also won uh, uh, another New South Wales uh, Science and Engineering Award for Emerging Research back in 2011. Uh, she's been listed uh, for uh, about six or seven years in the top 100 most influential engineers in Australia uh, and a range of other things. She is a fellow of the Academy of Science of Australia. She is a fellow of the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. She is a fellow of the Institute of Chemical Engineers, and she's an honorary fellow of the Institute of Engineers Australia. Please, today, welcome Rose. Uh, we're really looking forward to this talk, uh, Harnessing Solar Energy to Power Our Planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh, for kind introductions. Well, uh, friends, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure and honor, and I'd like to first thank the Office of uh, Chief Scientists for giving me this opportunity to share with you my perspectives as, uh, and also some of the research highlights on uh, harnessing solar energy and converting to chemical energy. So, Today we're talking about sun, and I think that we know that you know, we always take sun for granted. I mean, sun is a fireball, which the energy comes from the nuclear fusion reactions, and uh, although it's 150 million kilometers far away, we can still sense its radiations. We can sense its heat, and we can also um, see its brightness. So just to give you a bit of statistics of sun, it's, um, although it's 150 million kilometers away, as I mentioned, that the average solar flux at the top Earth's surface is, is around 1,367 watt per meter square. And so that's equivalent to about 173,000 terawatts, so it's enormous. And for Australia, the average solar radiation is around 58 million petajoule. The, um, giving you those numbers is that not just for you to remember, but we just wanted to tell you that how much the, the, the power of the sun energy and is how much is abandoned. 
And one of the things that we now use sun energy is in order to use it for generate our electricity. And the reasons, or one of the main reasons we can do that is because that the sun, the solar panel prices, is actually drop, drop a lot. From, for, if you look at the, the, the graphs that I show you over there, for the last 40 years, it's dropped by more than 100 times. So back in 70s, one watt of the solar cell will cost around $100, but now it's probably cost around 50 cents, so you can see. And thanks to science and technology, um, that, 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 that's, um, the, the technology is now evolving and affordable for many people. And in 2018, um, in December, the, the, the uh, two millions of Austrian households now has got solar panels, and so that's roughly about 20% of the house in Australia has the solar panels on the roof. And so, solar energy is not just the light, it's also the heat, and uh, people have used it a lot in um, society to use the solar heat in order to heat up the waters as well. And solar thermal can also use to generate electricity, but that's for household rooftop, you're normally just using the solar panels, solar cell semiconductors in order to generate the electricity. I showed two pictures there. It's, it's uh, the pl my home, also uh, powered by solar panel. Uh, now we have eight kilowatts of solar panel on the roof. That's sort of sufficient to power roughly about 20, 30% of what we use. And the building I work in is Tari Energy Technology Buildings. And, and that uh, building has 150 kilowatt of uh, solar panel uh, on our roof. And uh, uh, so in a good day like summer, it, it can power most of our administration activities like uh, computers, electricities of the offices. But the building is a very heavy duty in terms of energy, so we still need the power from the grid. So when we talk about renewable energy, wind energy, solar energy, and use it for society, we mainly focus on looking at power electricity, uh, or, or now we're talk, look, talking about that using this, this energy as well to, uh, for um, maybe electric car as well. But it's very seldom we were looking at looking at the harnessing solar energy to convert to chemical energy, um, which more recently now we're talking about hydrogen as is one of the chemical energy that we can store it. And so as a chemical engineer, about 20 years ago, I started to work on harnessing solar energy and convert it to chemical energy. Because it's talking about electrical engineer convert to electricity, and chemical engineers also can use that for, for uh, looking at the chemical energy. But, and we can also use it as a, as a direct use. So use the renewable energy, solar energy convert to chemical energy for heating, uh, or, act or also for chemical plant, uh, or, or we can use it as storage. So use the chemical energy to store it, say for example, store in hydrogen, and then use the hydrogen later on to power as a power to electricity as well. You might have the term called power to gas, or now recently has been extended to power to X. So this is a term to sort of looking at using renewable power. The renewable power, because the renewable power is intermittent, and so, so for example, like solar energy, although it's abandoned, but it's intermittent. So that is one of the problem. So it becoming, although it's affordable, but not sure whether it's reliable. So if you can store in chemical energies, then you can use it, that's becoming more reliable. So there's this term power to X is, is a term initially, as I mentioned, is uh, power to gas. This is for electrical engineers, they want to try to look at how to con uh, connect the power grid to the gas grid. So in terms of our energy network, we have the power grid electricity and we have the gas grid as well. If we're going to use renewable power like solar energy during daytime, it will be excess and we don't want the, the grid to be congested. And how we use this excess of energy to you know, convert to gas and then can put that gas into the, the, the gas network. And in the hydrogen, national hydrogen strategy, we're looking at look, using this excess in order to uh, convert water into the hydrogen and then use, put that into the gas grid as well and to mix it. And we can mix that up to about 10%. Uh, but it's not limited to the gas only. You can actually using the renewable power to make other things, for example, to make uh, methane to make uh, liquid as well, and, and some of the also formate and some of the chemical feedstocks that require in chemical industry. So my work, research work in my group is really focused on currently, we call it the power to X, harnessing the solar energy in, in order to convert to X, and X can be anything. It can be for electricity, can be for hydrogen, can be for power, and also can be for environment. So in some, uh, discipline, people call it power to X. In my discipline, I call it as a sustainable chemical industry. 
We're looking at how to harness the solar energy or how to harness the renewable energy and convert the small molecules such as carbon dioxide that's abandoned, that's waste, um, nitrogen, which is in air, water, uh, and also oxygen in air, and how to convert these small molecules back into some sort of uh, valuable products. And in chemical engineering or chemical industry, we normally use fossil fuels in order to be able to get, extract these raw materials for, for, uh, for plastics, for, uh, even for other type of commodity products. But how can we actually using solar energy, renewable energy, in order to break these small molecules that's abandoned or even waste like carbon dioxide that we don't want and convert it back to the uh, useful products? And uh, so this is part of the things that we're doing, and, and some of those things I'm going to highlight today in my talks as well. When we're talking about power to X, we probably the question is that uh, where does Australia stand? Uh, do we really have the, the, the resources to do that? Um, I believe we have, and it's not, not just my opinion. In, 19, uh, in 2018, there's a, a report from the World Energy Councils. They said that they identify Australia as the giant, uh, as a giant country for, for power to X, to using the renewable power to convert it to X. And we are not the front runner. Norway is the front runner. And one of the reasons we are not the front runner is because we haven't got the policy. We haven't got the infrastructures, but we have the resources. We have abandoned sunlight and also some wind energy in our southern part of the continent. Okay. So now I'm going to sort of give you some of the highlights of my research. I'll give you some of a bit of background of why I'm doing it, what's the significance to it. And uh, my work, a lot of them, is trying to harness the solar energy to convert to, ener to chemical energy. And when you're talking about uh, how to harness it, you can harness the photons, the light of the sun. You can harness the heat of the sun, the thermal part of the sun. Or you can use the the, the light and the heat to convert the electricity and use the electricity then in order to drive the catalysis reactions. Hugh mentioned about that. My work is looking at designing catalyst system. So we're using this catalyst system in order to harness those uh, sun energy and then convert it to chemical energy. And um, the first work that we, I'm doing, it's uh, oh, before that, so in, in terms of looking at the catalyst system that we, we, we're working on, we, we have a different type of uh, technology or different type of ways in order to design it. We use uh, what I call the flame synthesis, which is quite unique in our, our, our laboratory to be able to tailor make these nanomaterials. So we're talking about these nanomaterials that it, at a nanoscale, the properties are quite different from the bulk and utilize those nano properties in order to catalyze the reactions that might not be able to be uh, catalyzed if you're using just the bulk properties. And we're using a few other t uh, preparation methods. So our focus is a lot in terms of designing the catalyst. But at the same time, we're also uh, looking at the engineering, the systems as well, the reactor systems as well. Um, so when we're talking about when we designed the catalyst, the two things I think you will, you will hear from uh, my talk throughout is that we're looking at always that using this nano materials behavior to increase the active sites. By making it nano, we actually increase the number of these sites, and it's very important in order to increase efficiency, and also in terms of to reduce the amount of materials we use in order to reduce the cost. So efficiency and cost are our target, but in terms of doing that, we need to increase the number of active sites, and at the same time also increase the intrinsic activity. Sometimes it's not just active site, but make the active site even more active, so we're changing the activity by changing the intrinsic properties as well. So I will start with uh, talking about uh, research areas that I started about 20 years ago. So I work on photocatalysis. So in, the reason I'm interested in photocatalysis is because that since the area career, I'm always thinking that as a chemical engineer, we need to really work sustainably. We need to design process sustainably. And photocatalysis are caught my attention is because if you look at photocatalysis, there's two ingredients there in terms of driving the reaction. You need photon which you can get from the sun, and we need catalyst. And the catalyst is something that you can use again and again. And therefore, that you do not use chemicals that you use one time and then that's finished, and then you have to produce the chemicals and use it again. So that's one of the things that make it sustainable because you can use sunlight and you can use the materials that you can use it again and again. 
And there's a lot of different type applications that it, we can use photocatalysis. The first one that I was actually working on for about five to 10 years is looking at water treatment, because I was very passionate in terms of looking at make sure that we have sustainable process in order to treat our water and purify our air. At the same time, you can also use the photocatalysis for, to, to, to synthesize chemicals. And uh, more recently, I'm uh, working on using, looking at photocatalysis for uh, uh, hydrogen generations as well as our CO2 reduction. For those who are not familiar with photocatalysis, I mean, photocatalysis is actually what you use is we have to have use a semiconductor, so similar to like a, a solar panel, silicon. You use silicon as a semiconductor. So with the photocatalyst, what you need is that you need the photocatalyst, the semiconductor, and then you need the light. So when you have a light, it will activate the semiconductor to, to form this called the electron hole pairs. And holes is actually just an electron vacancy, and that holes is very oxidizing which is if you're looking at the application, for example, degradation of pollutant in water or degradation pollutant in air, if you have water molecules, the holes will react the water molecule forming some sort of radicals. And that radical species are very highly oxidizing, and that radical species will then degrade the organic, the pollutants that you want, or kill bacteria, for example, as well, and, and mineralize it, so carbon dioxide and water. So this is a very simple cartoon to sort of illustrate that there's a simple way of using light and catalyst, and you can use it again and again in, in order to purify your, your water or, or, or treat uh, the, the pollution from, from the air as well. And, um, well, in, in, in our work, we are not just looking at just the materials, the semiconductors, we're also looking at uh, designing the, the reactor system. I always say to my students when we design the materials is that when you're using photocatalysis, there are two ingredients that you need to remember. One is the photocatalyst, one is that the light. So you need to make sure that the light sees the, um, or, or the catalyst sees the light, because if not, there's no reaction. So we focus a lot of uh, looking at into designing the reactors, make sure that the, the, the catalyst can see the light. And we have a, a few different systems, and one of the systems that we put on the roof there, uh, which we call the Waterline Project, uh, um, that was uh, led by one of our PhD students, Constantine. And uh, this is water uh, filtrations together with photocatalysis to look at degradations of organic. And I would say that with the photocatalysis work after working for, for so many years, I don't think this is a process that we can use in order to replace the water treatment plant in, in, in say, for example, the prospect water treatment plant. It's a good process in order for a remote area, a good process that in areas that you cannot really transport a lot of chemical to that area, and it's a good uh, a process that in order to treat a small amount of water, uh, but it can be used sustainably. So, saying, so those are the work that we're doing for, for a long time, and uh, we have lots of publication. We have worked with industries as well, and we come up with some of few, few technologies. Um, but the same science can also be used in terms of looking at producing hydrogen. So what I'm trying to stress there is that uh, for people, who have some of the young academics who are here today, is that a lot of the science that you study could be five years ago, 10 years ago, and it, it could be still used now, and, and you can tailor it to the different applications. So with this one, we can looking at using a split water. Um, so in terms of producing the hydrogen, and as we know that nowadays, hydrogen energy is, is quite popular, uh, and it's because a lot of countries, especially Japan and South Korea, they would like to import uh, hydrogen, and therefore that we as a country have the opportunity to be able to produce this in large scale. And so again, we, we have uh, activities in the areas of using photocatalysts to produce hydrogen. And, but the problem in using photocatalysts is that the water splitting reaction is, we call it the uh, uphill reaction, which means that thermodynamically is very challenging, especially the oxygen oxidation reactions. And therefore that after researching for a while, we know that although the science is very interesting, there's a lot of publication, there's a lot of finding that needs to be done, but the commercial application of using photocatalysts directly, just using the light in order to produce hydrogen is very limited. Um, therefore, what we did then, looking at what's alternative. 
One of the way is that instead of splitting water, what we have now here in terms of photocatalyst, if you look at it, the holes now is we're looking at reducing, oh sorry, oxidizing organic. So with this particular process now, instead of splitting water, what we can use is we can use waste, for example, or, or can use biomass, for example, and we can photoreform the biomass to produce the hydrogen. Uh, biomass reforming, normally if you're going to use catalysis, you need require high temperature, which high temperature you need to have high energy. Uh, but if you can use photocatalysis, then you can use sunlight in order to break those organic and produce hydrogen. With those process, that is actually for, for our, our evaluation of our uh, economic feasibility study, that, that is a potential. So there are some projects that we have now funded by ARENA is actually looking at the biomass uh, photo reformings as well. So with, with this particular case, as I mentioned before, that then we can have using the waste and convert uh, the waste in terms of uh, to, to, to other chemical products and then extract the hydrogen and use the hydrogen as the clean energy fuels as well. And from the, the work that we're doing, we can see that the potential of forming or, or producing hydrogen in much larger scale. All right. So, okay, so what I've explained so far is that as I mentioned, when you harness the solar energy, you can harness the light, you can harness the heat, and, and you can also harness the, uh, uh, the, the um, using the light and the heat in order to produce electricity. The one that I think that uh, will be more in the, um, ready for commercial applications, because we're talking about when we're looking at the Australian National Hydrogen Strategy, we really need to have the technology out there in order to start producing our hydrogen, and, and we need to be ready. So the work that we're doing, and, and also there's quite a number of groups in Australia as well and all over the world, is, is looking at instead of using the light straight away to activate the catalyst to produce hydrogen, we use the PV, so the PV in order to harness the solar energy, produce the electricity, and then the electricity will then use electrocatalysis to activate the electrocatalyst to produce the hydrogen. So again, our work is uh, focused on trying to get uh, active, um, selective and also stable and also cost effective. So most of our work in terms of the design of the catalyst system, we're trying to improve the activity uh, by increasing the number of active size and order to reduce the cost. Hugh mentioned about platinum. Platinum is a catalyst that people use in electrolyzer in order to uh, produce hydrogen. So our effort is trying to um, looking at using other type of metal, transition metal, for example, nickel, cobalt, iron. So those are the, 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 the resources, metals that we actually, Australia has plenty of that. And I always say to um, uh, people who, in, uh, who visit our laboratories that uh, I really agree with uh, our chief scientist, Alan Finkel, saying that we're going to export our sun energy to, uh, to, to Japan, to South Korea, but we need to make sure that we do not repeat our mistakes of just exporting raw resources and then have to import the technologies. We need to be up there in order to be able to also come up with the technology. So having be able to cover electrolysis that operating using nickel, iron, cobalt, which is we have plenty of those resources, and then sell this technology or using this technology, then we actually uh, will be a winner, not, not just a follower. So those are the research that we're doing. It's again, we're looking at how to making this as, as a nanomaterials, uh, like two-dimensional nanosheets, and, and, and putting in active catalysts. And another work that we're doing, although we're still using platinum, but we reduce the amount of platinum. Say, for example, in electrolyzers like the PEM electrolyzers, the proton exchange membrane, they're using platinum. They're using 28 percent of platinum in order to be able to drive the catalysis. So the work that we're doing, we're trying to reduce that. One of the work that we're doing, we're using single atom. We design the platinum to be single atom, and then that single atom site can activate the hydrogen generations. And that single atom, we only need one atom percent. So we're talking about you know, 20 times less in terms of the amount of platinum that's required. We also have um, a project with ARENA. It, we are working together or collaborating with the uh, PV people, the photovoltaic people with the Professor Martin Green's group. And uh, Professor Martin Green's, they have this uh, world record uh, PV, which is the, the concentrated PV. Um, and one of the, the reasons we wanted to work together is because with the concentrated PV, it, it's great. It, it's, it gives us a very high efficiency in terms of the solar to electricity, but it generates a lot of heat, which we need to cool down. 
and but we can harness those heat and use that heat in order to actually heat up our electrolyzer and improve our efficiency. So this is one of the arena project is trying to look at the energy balance and using the, the waste, including the waste heat, in order to power the, our electrolyzers. And what we found is that doing that, we actually can uh, increase the, the efficiency and increase the uh, or reduce the electricity, the, the power required to power the electrolyzers by about five times. So we can see that that's a lot of the things that we can really improve in, uh, in terms of the operation of the uh, PV electrolyzer. We also work on uh, the areas of um, seawater electrolyzer. Currently, commercially, there are two types of electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers, the proton exchange membrane, uh, and then the other electrolyzer is alkaline electrolyzer, which is using alkaline uh, as the electrolyte. But as we know, now it's not too bad. Our, our dam level is, is up to about over 80 percent. But if you speak to the uh, New South Wales government about two months ago, and then the level is two, uh, 40 something percent, we're all very concerned because fresh water is also is, is a pr pr precious commodity. So we're looking at into, uh, looking at electrolysis that we can uh, harness or we can generate the hydrogen from the seawater, and we're able to. Um, design catalysts that will be able to withstand the, the, the harshness of the, the seawaters as well. Okay, so, so far what I'm talking about is that I talk about harnessing the solar energy to degrade, water, uh, degrade pollutant in water. I talk about that harnessing the solar energy in terms of the uh, producing hydrogen. Another thing is that we talk about the, the global warming, we talk about carbon dioxide. When, uh, when I was a student, probably about 35 years ago, um, carbon dioxide is not really a problem. But as, as we now, we sort of realize that carbon dioxide, as you can see, that there's a strong correlation between the carbon dioxide concentrations in our atmospheres and the, the global average temperature. So carbon dioxide is a problem. Um, and I don't think that we can really switch to renewables straight away. We don't have enough we don't have enough uh, renewable energy in order to power it. We still need to use the fossil fuel. So the problem is not just the fossil fuel itself, because we still have the, the, the fossil fuel. The problem is that the carbon dioxide that we emitted. So from the chemical industry as well, we produce carbon dioxide. From, from the power plant, produce carbon dioxide. Can we capture the carbon dioxide? I know we're talking about capture the carbon dioxide and storing it somewhere. Um, but not all the, the, the geologies is actually, or all the states can actually do that. And if carbon dioxide, you got this carbon, can we actually using it and converting it to some valuable products? So this is a program that we also do in, in our laboratory in, in terms of looking at converting carbon dioxide back to uh, valuable products. Um, we started with looking at photocatalysis, which is using just a light to activate it. But with uh, that particular process, because again, when the reactions is thermodynamically up, uh, challenging, so it's uphill, it's very, very difficult. So our work in the laboratories then is, is to um, try to look at uh, how to not just harness the light, but harness the heat as well. Because if you look at the, the, the sun spectra, it's, it's the sun spectra, more than 50% is actually the infrared, it's the heat. And or if we only just use the light to power the, the looking at the electricity or, or using the light to drive the reaction, we lost that other 50%. So in our system now, we're looking at hybrid system, which is trying to harness both the light and the heat. And um, so these reactions, when we're talking about carbon dioxide back to uh, valuable products, say for example, methanations using carbon dioxide and, and react with the hydrogen, it's actually an old reaction. So what we're doing now is, is trying to look at whether we can use the sun energy uh, rather than using furnace in order to convert this carbon dioxide to methane uh, or, or carbon dioxide to ethanol or carbon dioxide to other hydrocarbon. And to do that, we need to really revisit the catalyst and the catalyst system and the reactor system. So this is another thing that our group is uh, actually working on. And uh, the, the work is, is, is led by my, my colleague, uh, Jason Scott and Emma, Emma, who is here in the audience today as well. So when we design those catalysts, we need to really look at what is the source of energy and what sort of the systems we have in order to be able to really capture the, the most of the system. And we also built, uh, I call it the uh, 
um, integrated solar, electro solar electrolyzer and solar thermal catalysis thermal catalytic process. Um, as a chemical engineer, when we show our students, we were trying to train them to sort of think sustainably. So in this particular process, what we in our raw materials is mainly just sun energy, um, solar power, and solar panel. And the, uh, the, 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 the chemical is mainly just the CO2 and, and water. Um, and so we we're using the sun to, in order to power the solar panel to uh, split the water from the water to become hydrogen, and the hydrogen will then react with the CO2 that's in the sort of the red, uh, the, the red box there, the CO2 cylinders is in the red box, the CO2 and uh, the hydrogen that produce from the splitting water, and then that will be powered by the solar collectors there, you can see that there's a solar collector that is heat up the, the reactor system, and it can heat up the reactor system up to about uh, 700 degrees, but with the reactions that we need for these particular reactions, we only need up to about 300 degrees. So if you can see, that is really, you need only sun, you need only CO2, you need only water in order to produce your hydrocarbon. And so this is a process that we can use in order to convert the CO2 back to hydrocarbon. When I speak to uh, people in electrical engineers, they, they, they're interested in power to gas. So this is our power to gas plan as well. Because in a sense that if you got the renewable power, you have got access of that. If you got a plants like that, you can really convert that the CO2 to, to methane, and methane is a natural gas that you can really actually put it into the, um, uh, the gas, gas grid. This is just a video that we, we took. Um, when we build this particular plant, as I mentioned before, it's, it's for us to, in order to demonstrate to our chemical engineers how to think sustainably, how to design sustainably. Uh, and uh, so we, we actually made it a couple years ago for our open day. And it has been something becoming a conceptual demonstration plan that now is on the roof of the Tyree building. Uh, and to, to show that, that when we looking at the designing process, it's important to be able to really think sustainably. So I already mentioned about that, uh, that you got the, uh, this is the reactors, the reactors where we put our catalyst in there. Uh, the hydrogen pressure, we got the electrolyzer and we got a solar tracking uh, in order to be able to move the uh, solar collector to, uh, it will track where the, the sun is in order to maximize in terms of harnessing the solar power in order to, uh, to power the, uh, the, the reactors. Okay, so that is one process which is looking at harnessing the sun light and sun heat in order to power the reaction system, catalysis system. But at the same time as well that we can also use the photovoltaic electrolysis system in our, that we used before, to, that we look at using to produce hydrogen in order for reducing the CO2. So that's another thing that we're doing in our laboratory is, is to looking at the PV electrolyzer. And, why is that? It's because that with the PV electrolyzer system, then we can have it sort of more decentralized. We can have it in terms of uh, looking at the backyard if you wanted to produce formate and, and, and so on, and, and looking at CO2, because it's, it's a smaller system. And when we started the work back in 2015-14, uh, I was not really very confident when I talked to industry in terms of this process because when at that stage we are looking at that when we produce the amount of uh, the, the, the products is in terms of micromoles, but things really change. And again, that is sort of thanks to research, thanks to science and technology. And I, I really like this sort of um, uh, the, the collaborations uh, efforts as well because Working these areas is not just only my group, but there's quite a number of groups in Australia working in these areas, and we actually learn from each other. And there's something a culture that I think that's important in science is, is to be able to compete and, and learn from each other. And, and from, from that, we actually excel very, very quickly. And so in our work, as I already mentioned, we normally focus on the catalysis system as well as looking at the electrolyzers or, or the system engineering. And in the catalysis system, we're looking at increasing the number of active sites, increasing the intrinsic activity, as I mentioned already before. And when we're talking about active sites, we're looking at changing the morphology. 
So, for example, we're looking at designing the nanowires. By making it nanowires, then you have a lot of exposed active sites. And making it mesoporous, for example, then we increase the areas as well. In this particular example, that I'm going to show you the next couple of examples that we're using it, the CO2 electrolyzer to, to reduce carbon dioxide to products, we actually change the intrinsic activity. For example, we're actually using something carbon which is normally quite inert in terms of uh, um, CO2 electrolyzer. But then if we introduce some nanoparticles in there like cobalt metal, the presence of the cobalt metal particles actually will change the electronic properties of the carbon. The carbon is no longer carbon in terms of their activity for, for CO2 reductions. It's becoming active and we can re reuse it in the, to, to reduce the CO2. And when we started work, we started with uh, looking at using materials such as silver because at that time uh, only gold and silver, those, those, those more expensive materials are very, very active. So we started with that in terms of trying to looking at how we can uh, uh, change the properties in terms of the morphology. So we're using the silver foam. Um, then we move on to something more, uh, something cheaper. We're looking at copper. So with the silver, we can convert carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. Uh, and carbon monoxide is one of the ingredients of syngas. We actually convert the carbon dioxide in water to form syngas, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. Uh, and when we, we develop the copper materials, and with the copper materials, we actually can convert the carbon dioxide and water to becoming ethanol and methanol, which are more, more valuable products. And uh, the only thing is that with, with those mixtures, then you've got a lot of uh, cocktails and materials that you have to separate them. So our work now is currently is looking at selectivities, how to be able to really tailor. So if we wanted to reduce carbon dioxide to methanol or alcohol, can we just making ethanol only or making methanol only? So that is one of the things that, again, we wanted to tune the intrinsic activities, the electronic properties of the catalyst. When you're using tin, tin is another one. Uh, well, by changing the, 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 the intrinsic properties, we are able to make in formate. So again, formate is a uh, chemical, is, is a raw materials for, for a lot of uh, uh, chemical productions as well. And I already mentioned before that uh, one of the things that we're doing in terms of designing the catalyst is that uh, we're looking at also the changing the intrinsic activities of the, the material. So for example, like the carbon, we have nanoparticles like cobalt, and then we change the, 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 the properties, which is the, the carbon. Uh, and by changing that, we can, we can see that we can have uh, materials that can form in syngas. And syngas is a, one of the, the, the precursors that's very important in chemical industry, because syngas is the precursor that you can use in order to make diesel, can make gasoline, and Previously, in order to make syngas, you actually need to use fossil fuel. You need to really do the reforming of the fossil fuel to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen. But now we can use an electrolyzer in order to convert CO2 back to uh, syngas. The same things. What we're doing is also not just looking at making something that is active, as I mentioned, we're also making something stable. So if our aim is to eventually later on in order to convert CO2 that coming up from exhaust, for example, from power plant or from a chemical industry, normally those carbon dioxide will not be pure carbon dioxide, but will be carbon dioxide that might have a bit of NOx, might have a bit of SOx, might have other impurities. So our aim is also to design materials that will be able to withstand all those uh, impurity and be able to still operating at, uh, uh, at uh, high um, stream and high flow rate and also uh, different type of chemicals in the systems as well. So in, in this particular process, we're looking at uh, designing the, the, the anti-poisoning, we call it anti-poisoning catalyst in order to convert the carbon dioxide to syngas. And uh, we also develop some sort of a, a reactor system that we can actually produce things in a large scale as well. Because if we want to talk to industry in order for them to convince that this is a, a technology that we can use in the future, we, are able, we should be able to be able to operate in much higher level than what we could five years ago, which is in micro malls. Um, so, from the work that we're doing, we sort of uh, realized that now, uh, but from the understanding, we actually evolve a lot in terms of uh, be able to produce something, not just from the material side, but from the reactor system side. 
back in 2015, when we're talking about the productions of the reductions of the carbon dioxide, the products from the carbon dioxide, we're talking about 0.05 millimoles. Um, so we're talking about very, very tiny amount and so micromoles. But now we're talking about um, the products that we can really uh, obtain is up to about 2.1, 10 to the pi, tower 5 millimole of per hour per centimeter square. So you're talking about that you are actually able in four years' time to uh, uh, make the, 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 the process much, much more uh, efficient. And uh, we are at a scale now, I believe, in a, a stage that the technology that we can really talk to in, uh, the, the, the industry and to so see where we can upscale the process as well. So just to conclude, what we're talking about, the HANAS in solar energy, and uh, when we're talking about power to X, we are not just look, talking about now in order to, uh, to connect the power grid to the gas grid. So initially, when this term was developed, we're talking about mainly just to looking at HANA Sinto solar energy in order to convert and making some gas products that we can convert to gas grid. But from the other disciplines like chemical engineering, we're talking about now, we are able to looking at HANA the solar energy and convert the small molecules such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and this morning I was talking to Hugh in terms of looking at using this solar energy power PV to convert nitrogen and water to ammonia. Currently, the process that we're using ammonia productions is Haber-Bosch process, which requires high pressure and high temperature. But if we could have using PV electrolyzer and capture the nitrogen and water and produce the ammonia, we can have decentralize our fertilizer plant. And we can put that is actually into the, directly into the farm. And we do not, we actually also can uh, minimize the transport cost uh, and, and a lot of energy that is probably will not be, will, be, will just be wasted. So I think that there's a lot of potentials of looking at HANA Sing Sana energy, not just looking at just the power, but also in the, in the chemical plants as well. Okay, when I talk about photocatalysis 20 years ago, when I introduced the significance of our work, I always refer 2020 as a future. So something coming, global warming, climate change is something that will be in the futures. But I think that we cannot really deny anymore now with the current, with the recent catastrophe that we experienced. And with the very strong correlations between the CO2 concentrations and the average global temperatures, I believe that we all have a responsibility to act because I think we, when I started my work in terms of uh, looking at sustainability, I always trigger with this, uh, the, the, the definition of sustainable development. You have to develop a process that meets your need now, but also will not compromise the need of the future generations. So we all have responsibility as, as scientists, engineers, politicians, that we should um, hand the planet to our future generations in a way that they can really live comfortably. I'd like to leave you with one of a very uh, quote that I really like from Jane Goodall is, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funding agency, my institution, University of New South Wales, and funding agency, Australian Research Councils, ARENA, and all the uh, partners that are uh, supporting our research past and present, because without their support, we will not be able to deliver the outcomes. And last but not least, I'd like to um, acknowledge my, the, the group members, past and present as well, because uh, the highlights that I mentioned today, I, not, I didn't go through in details, um, if you're interested in a certain aspects of the project, I'm more than happy to discuss with you after the talk, or you are more than welcome to visit our laboratory. And, uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attentions as well. So unusually, actually, I think I'm going to ask the first question. Okay. Normally I get the thing, because you said very early on about keeping the technology in Australia, and you showed us some great technology here. And I know we've got a number of MPs in the audience, and I know we have businessmen like Peter Tyree uh, down here. So in your estimation, what do we need to do to genuinely take what you have and create an industry? What's necessary on behalf of the government here? Or business? Okay. Um, I think we need a lot of support and the policies as well, because um, 
it's it's very difficult. I mean, for me, I'm I'm not very experienced in terms of startup. I don't have any startup companies, but talking to colleagues as well, it it is re require a lot of uh, investment, a lot of support, and a lot of beginning in terms of translating from uh, translation from the the research that from laboratory to a large scale. Mm -hmm. So the scale that I show you, we're talking about sort of you know gram, milligram, kilogram, right? But in order to get up there, you need to really show it's, it's in terms of uh, you know, hundreds of kilograms. So those kind of scaling up, I think it's very important. So we need the, the businessmen and also the, the government in order to perhaps uh, give, give us some support in terms of to be able to help us to translate that. One of the examples is the New South, New South Wales Physical Science Fund. I think I, I, I was on the panel last year, so I think that is a very, very important scheme in order to be able to help the, 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 the work like this, that is sort of like you can see that this application is not really micro moles anymore. It's, it's in terms of that you can see a scale that is promising. You might need a bit more boost of, of uh, resources, either power uh, in terms of people, engineers, in order to really translate to larger scale. Okay. Right. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions. Peter. So the microphone just coming round. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, lovely talk. Um, it's times like this that I wish I wasn't any, any electrical engineer, that I was a chemical engineer. What, what you put up uh, integrates everything together. I'm wondering if you've got yet a target cost per whatever the units might be relevant for each of the outputs that you would get from what we're looking at here, whether it's the electricity that you might generate or the conversion of the carbon dioxide into the methane, which I must admit is fabulous. Um, have you got the, these targets that then might help the businessmen like me in the audience want to uh, continue to support what you're doing, uh, that we can see commercialisation at the end of the day. Thank yeah. you. I think in terms of the cost analysis for the hydrogen electrolyzers that's out there, that uh, that's, it, the, the cost, it keep on decreasing. And I think uh, we're talking about a technology probably another maybe three, four years that we can really see that that's going to large scale. With the CO2 one, it's, it's ongoing. We actually have project, which is, uh, I think you were at the, uh, the, the launch last week. So part of that is power to gas. And, and part of the studies as well is to do the techno-economic feasibility. Uh, in order to do this, we, we need, normally need to have a, a little bit more sort of a larger scale. We, we have a smaller scale re, re, um, sort of uh, products and, and so on, but then we also have to have a model of in terms of the large scale. So part of that hub, the integrated of storage solution system, is in terms of looking at the, not just the technology, but also the economic feasibility. Um, I mentioned that we talk about ammonia. I think that is a very, very interesting if we could do that because I can see there's a lot of uh, potential application in decentralized ammonia production, fertilizer production. Uh, that's also part of the things that we're going to do. Uh, in, uh, we, we, we realize it now. I mean, you know, we cannot just doing the research and the science, but when we want to talk to someone like you, Peter, we need to really put the dollar signs up there. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, we've got one here. Sorry. So just to a microphone will come, just a second. Thank you. Rose, that was a wonderful talk. Um, we do a lot of outreach into high schools around jobs for the future. Um, so with this kind of industry, um, with both the electrical and chemical engineering, there's clearly a small body of skilled um, people that can do all these processes. What do we need to do in our education system and how early do we need to introduce these kinds of, it's not even electrical or chemical engineering, but sustainability engineering into the, the curriculum as early as possible? Like how young should we introduce you know, the next phase of workforce to look at um, solutions like this that are sustainable engineering? I would say that we should introduce as young as possible. When you introduce the science subject, I think sustainability can be there. When you introduce about society, social issues, sustainability has to be there. Um, and I think nowadays the young people, they're actually very passionate about the planet, about the environment. So if you can sort of show it to them that there is a solution and, and they are part of the solution, 
then I'm sure that we can probably attract more of people to do STEM subjects. Um, I, next week, not next week, two weeks, I'm going to visit uh, high schools as well, and, and year seven, year eight, and, and then also year 12. Um, so that's part of sort of uh, my role as well, we're trying to sort of see how we can really promote STEM. And the reasons they wanted to talk to me is, is, is not because I'm chemical engineers, but because I'm talking about renewable energy. Uh, and, and, and therefore that they'd like to understand a little bit more what, uh, you know, how we as, as an engineer can really contribute to this. Yes, there's, there's a question over there and then I'll come back to you in a second. Yeah, very interesting, Rose. I'm just curious with your processes up on this chart. Um, aviation fuel, um, which needs a high energy density, is probably not the only area that needs high energy density. So can you envisage in what sort of time frame that we can have processes that could make our own aviation fuel from basic raw materials? Well, I'm not sure exactly the time frame in terms of that, but I think when I'm talking about the CO2, um, re either using electrolyzer, one of the things you can make syngas, and a lot of the aviation fuels as well, you can use syngas in order to be able to produce that. So you might need another extra process in order to do aviation fuel, but perhaps working on that the aviation fuel, you can use solar panel to, to um, power the electricity for the aviation fuel. Um, but I, I'm not really sure in terms of the time frame. Um, thank you for the talk, but I wanted to know whether you've had a talk with Scott Morrison. <laughs> um, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, I had a talk with uh, our Premier when I received the Premier Award, and she's a very nice lady, seems to be understandable as well, and, and, and very appreciated in terms of what we're doing. But I, I think... For me, I think it, it is important for us to uh, w talk, work together. I, I know that uh, I'm working in renewable energy, but at the same time, I also we have to try to respect to, to find out you know, what's, what's going on with the people who can work fossil fuel, why they don't want to change. Rather than point the fingers, how about we were trying to come up with a way to be able to work together. So with the example of the, the CO2 one, uh, as, as I said, I don't think that we can switch straight away. We will still have to use fossil fuel. So similar to when in 80s, when we have chemical industry producing all these pollutants that go to the river, we need to treat that pollutant, right? We cannot close the chemical industry. So we need to come up with a technology and solution to treat the pollutant, Then currently the pollutant is a CO2. So I think that we need to convince our government that the carbon dioxide is an issue if you still want to use fossil fuel, you need to really look, come up with the technologies and process and, and, and investment now in order to capture that and utilize it. Uh, just for the next question, I might add, uh, I think next week from memory, uh, the preliminary decarbonization report that the, uh, my office has been working on for the state will be um, published. Uh, and that has a big part of the sorts of things that Rose is talking about. So the state government, certainly our minister, Minister Keane, is very uh, keen, I should say, <laughs> on, uh, on that sort of thing. Sorry. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, process intensification and micro-reactors, distributed manufacturing has been a popular concept in chemical engineering for maybe 20 years now. But I'm not aware of any uh, technologies where you've been able to overcome the fundamental economics. And st there are still very large chemical manufacturing centres being built around the world because it's the cheapest, ultimately, when you get down to cost of capital and cost of uh, production. Do any of your catalyst technologies have the potential to shift the fundamental economics to be able to make distributed manufacture viable e in economic terms? Um, yes, there's a lot of um, new micro-reactor systems and one of the issues is, is that uh, the, the cost is very high. And I think that's part of the things that we, in terms of the catalyst, is to sort of see that whether we can reduce the amount of catalyst and also reduce the amount of energy required. So if by using micro-reactor system, if you can reduce the energy required, uh, and, and therefore that you might be able to make it more viable. But uh, I think this is something that um, not, not just, uh, you know, we, we're looking at uh, this, the near futures, but uh, we're distant futures in order to try to look, look at more the economic feasibilities of all this new intensification system. Mm. 
It's a very interesting question. Uh, any more, one more question. So that we got, how would, you want to go? Okay. Hang on, uh, the microphone's just coming. In fact, you're going to have two of them, so you can do it in stereo. Good. <laughs> two microphones, only one, I think. Uh, yeah, very interesting talk and uh, technologies that you mentioned, Rose. Uh, as an electrical engineer, I'm fascinated, particularly with the overall efficiencies of what you're proposing. It strikes me that the, I think you called it STH, that's something that's new for my mind, direct solar to hydrogen. Uh, that in itself then faces the challenge that it would be a distributed production of hydrogen, and hydrogen is a very difficult energy source to actually harness and use usefully. And it strikes me that your challenge with that particular process is that you'd have very small quantities of hydrogen distributed, say, right across the state. So how would you overcome that, that issue? And in fact, I think the whole hydrogen economy has huge challenges in itself because it's the lightest element. It, uh, it needs to be compressed, it needs to be liquefied, it needs to be transported, and then final use. And a few numbers that I've, on the back of an envelope that I've done, indicate that at best you might get less than 20% of the energy input at the back end of the whole process. So how do you see that stacking up as being feasible? Yes. Um, yeah, hydrogen, the production is one challenge. The storage is another one. Um, so if you're talking about the hydrogen, you're going to transport. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Akui Zinzo, they're working on looking at storing the hydrogen in solid form. So in that case, that you can actually store more. Um, and with the hydrogen that we're looking at, I, I think that we need to have a sort of a suits of technologies. It cannot be just the generations and, and improving the just the you know, high solar to hydrogen efficiency, but we need to look at also the, the transport and also the storage in order to make it viable. Um, in fact, that um, we are currently putting a proposal to, to set up a, a, a training centers on the global hydrogen economy, which is looking at all aspects of that, from the generations, from the storage, the, the, the transport, the safety, techno-economic feasibility, and also social, exception, uh, social perceptions and uh, engagement uh, acceptance as well, because I think it is important. Uh, I would say that in order to realize that we need all aspects of that, um, and uh, it, there's no just one solution. Um, I, I, I do not have the solution for you, but I think that it, it is important that every part of it to work together in order to come up with uh, a way of to be able to deliver this technology to the society. We might draw it to a close there. I would like everyone to join together and please thank Rose again for a great talk. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I just want to point out that on your chairs, uh, our next uh, talk, which is quite relevant, I hope, uh, will be uh, given by uh, Ross Bradstock from uh, uh, Woll Wollongong University, and it's on the science of bushfire risk. Um, Ross is a, an expert in bushfires, bushfire modelling, uh, and the engineering and science behind it. So I think it'll be a fascinating talk. And also on your chair, is uh, bar one exciting person yet to be named uh, 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 at this point here. Uh, again, a really exciting mixture of speakers, uh, including Dietmar uh, Muller in geology, um, uh, Liz Pelicano in autism, and a number of others. So please, we uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, at the next breakfast seminar. Thank you again.